Those of you who are here for the last session will learn I only I have a limited number of tricks. So how's everybody doing? How was the last session? Good. This one will be better. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, uh, thank you so much for, for being here today. Um, I, I want to start with a sort of basic question about the title of the book, Culture, the story of us from cave art to K-pop. It is very brave, I think, to aspire to so much in one book. Tell me why you felt like you needed to do that for this book at this time. Mm, yes, F fair question. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so it, it really started a few years ago when you know, scenes that take place everywhere, people who care about culture, artists, libraries, teachers, sitting around the table with friends, bemoaning the decline of the arts and humanities, both in the university, and it's mostly a university story, but maybe more generally. And, you know, after such an evening, and there had been many such evenings, I, I went home and I suddenly realized I didn't really know what the arts and humanities were. And so, you know, I started to ask myself these fundamental questions. If, you, if we bemoan the decline of something, we better have an answer to what, what the it is. And so I started to muse about the history of the arts and philosophy and, and literature and, and realized that I didn't have a good account of them, that I didn't have a good sense of, you know, how how they start and how they develop. And at some point I realized that I was in some sense asking the wrong question. I wasn't asking so much about, I wasn't worried so much about the academic, you know, departments grouped under the humanities. What I really was one, thinking about was, was culture, humans as a culture producing species, making these special objects or gathering in particular places to make meaning together. And so I thought that in order to have that conversation about the decline of the humanities and many others too, it would actually be very helpful to ask that fundamental question, what culture is, how it works, uh, to inform all the contemporary debates. So it wasn't so much a, an attempt to cover it all, obviously that's not the case, but to, to ask a fundamental question that I had realized I had never asked myself mm -hmm. and to try to come up with an answer. So when I think about this book, I think about it on an axis, on a kind of X, Y axis. And on my X axis, which runs this way, yes? I'm not a mathematician, yes, okay. My X axis runs this way. I think about two terms. On one, on one end of the axis is preservation. Culture is what is preserved, it is what is transmitted, and the work of preservation and transmission is done through institutions, like the schools you and I work at, or like this library, or like this festival. These are all institutions of cultural transmission and preservation. And on the other end of the axis is erasure, <laughs> that there are so many different ways for culture to be forgotten, to be destroyed, or simply to be subject to time. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how erasure and preservation are two of the elemental forces shaping yeah. this yeah, wonderful yeah, book. Yeah. No, that, that's a brilliant axis, and I will steal that and use Please, that go from, ahead. It's from, all yours. from now on. Because that, in a way, is exactly what stood out for me, because I started to think about how, you know, as I said, as a kind of almost species history of humans as a culture producing species. And then the next thought was, well, we don't pass culture down through our genes the way we do our DNA. In the case of culture, we have to devise institutions and techniques and storage systems. Storage became, maybe because it's used technologically so much today, became another term uh, in which we pass it down from one generation to the next. Because if we don't do it, it's lost, it's erased, it's lost, it's forgotten. Uh, though sometimes then it's rediscovered. It's also, interestingly, 
it's hard to erase something entirely. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, things have been erased entirely, but often something remains, some material remains, and it's part of the stories. It's also a story of recoveries. Uh, um, but so I started to think about how that passing down works, and institutions are a big answer to that, um, including this institution. Technologies are uh, an, an answer, storage as a term, because if the person-to-person -person transmission breaks down or degenerates or it's also full of errors and so on and so forth, then it's helpful to have some material remains. I start with the story of the Chauvet cave where you know, humans started to create this, uh, 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 this artwork uh, over the course of thousands of years. Great continuity here. And the cave became for me a kind of storage system or an institution where people gathered, they went only there to create that work, intergenerational art for thousands of years. It's amazing that kind of continuity. But then a landslide closes off the entrance to the cave and humans no longer have access to it and it remains shut for a few thousand years until another landslide opens a side entrance and then a second group of humans enter the caves. And they see this work that's been created thousands of years in the past using probably a style that is maybe unrecognizable to them by people they wouldn't understand. And so then they have to make sense of it. Uh, there suddenly they have access to something that had been forgotten or you know, erased uh, for thousands of years. And then they try to make sense of it and continued the work in a different style. And then it shut, gets shut off and then remains shut off uh, for almost 25,000 years uh, until the late 19th century. So that for me becomes sort of a, it's the first chapter and sort of about longevity, continuity, but also interruption, uh, forgetting, uh, and then encountering something, a remains, a fragment from the past. And I think in some ways we are all like that second group, sort of latecomers to culture. There's always someone who has made something in the past before us, and we're trying to understand it. We probably can't really understand it, but we have to make sense of it, and then we have to make it our own in some way. There are two complications I want to introduce to our x-axis. The first is that sometimes an event or a phenomenon that you think is going to be destructive of culture ends up preserving it. So you have a wonderful chapter on Pompeii, mm and how the eruption of the volcano and the spilling of the lava and the scattering of the ash over the city actually ended up preserving right. a historical way of living, yes. a culture that otherwise would have been entirely inaccessible to us. Can you just tease out that complication a little bit for me? Absolutely, and it, uh, that for me was one of the sort of surprising things because you know I, like most people in culture, we are all on the preservation side, right? Because so much gets lost anyway uh, uh, through war and destruction or landslides and so on and so forth. But I started to realize that at least for historians of culture, sometimes destructions like that landslide in the Chauvet cave uh, or the volcano, volcano that, that destroys uh, uh, Pompeii but also preserves it create these kind of time capsules. And for you know, historians of culture, they are of course brilliant to have this time, time capsule in there, few enough, but if you have them, you, you get that preserved access to a, to a past that would otherwise be uh, uh, forgotten or changed. And so I think the solution to the paradox, if you will, is that there is one thing that's more destructive than landslides and wars and volcanoes, and that's continual use by humans. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, so for example, in Pompeii, that chapter hinges on a statue from South Asia uh, uh, that that someone bought and brought from what is today Afghanistan to, to this provincial Roman town, and, and that gets preserved mm -hmm. by the volcano. Um, if the volcano had not erupted and Pompeii had just been continually occupied, very likely someone would have, I don't know, would have been thrown away or you know, sold away. We wouldn't have that. We wouldn't know as much about the traffic between Rome and and East Asia. So yes, yeah, so these very destructive moments interrupt continual use by humans. And it's not great for the people living or dying there, but 
you know, uh, uh, paradoxically or maybe not paradoxically, it's great for historians. <laughs> the other complication that I, I want to ask you about is that oftentimes the person who does the recovery or the discovery or the remembering isn't the same as the person who has made the object in the first place. There is sort of hanging over this book a kind of cloud of current conversations mm -hmm. around cultural appropriation, around the return of artifacts mm -hmm. from museums with long right. colonial histories right. back to the nations or the communities that those mm -hmm. artifacts mm -hmm. were taken from. Can you speak a little bit about how power and appropriation mm -hmm. end up playing mm -hmm. into these ideas of preservation and or erasure? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it was, as you say, in the back of my mind, I don't really use the term cultural appropriation in the book, um, though I um, speak about it indirectly. And, you know, there I think that in the current discourse, in a sense, the book is also meant as a kind of deep history to inform right. that current debate is, I guess, one way of putting it. And what I... I think for me, the takeaway point in trying to sort of puzzle this out and think about cultural appropriation through deep history um, is that I think when we use cultural appropriation, and I'm not, I think, the first one to say this today, we have certain sort of bad outcomes in mind that we are trying to avoid. For example, extremely um, disrespectful uses of another culture based on total in ignorance and so on and so forth, or crassly commercial uh, uses of certain culture, also mostly based on, on ignorance, as just, just the, you know, to, to start with those two. Um, and then the third that you mention, um, all the objects and artifacts that your mostly European colonial powers amassed and brought to European museums and American museums. And so the sort of the fate of these objects and under what circumstances that they were acquired. And so I think that, you know, I completely agree with the people who use the term cultural appropriation that completely disrespectful uses of other culture are terrible and we should find a way of not endorsing that uh, or crassly commercial ones I also think that in quite a few circumstances, the return of cultural objects, artifacts, is com makes complete sense to me because they were acquired under very dubious circumstances and under conditions of extreme power differentials. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, I do think that there's one thing I don't like about this term cultural appropriation and that is that it presumes that culture is owned by either individuals and groups and that they also can control the past. Um, and the reason why I became skeptical of that is not so much that I don't understand that especially very uh, groups that live on the margins of large societies that discriminate against them need their own culture to preserve their own traditions, but because I think in the end, if you look at any tradition, you look close enough, you see that it's made out of other traditions. And that culture thrives, and this is sort of one big takeaway point for me, under conditions of borrowing. So I think in the end, what we should work towards is not less borrowing, but more and better forms of borrowing. And I think cultural appropriation, I think does not get us there as a term. You know, I, this is not a complication to my x-axis. I will turn to the y. Oh, we have some applause. Okay, we'll <laughs> applaud, we'll applaud. Yes, we can all applaud, yes. We can. Uh, I will turn to the y-axis in a, oh, in a, in a moment. Yeah. In a, oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, Can you, you tell know, me how many axes there will be? Uh, this, is a, this is, what is that? The, we're just working on two dimensions, two dimensions. here. All it's right, fine. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it occurs to me that this is a book that is almost willfully non-nationalistic. It is a book that takes us all over the world. And the case studies that you choose are case studies in which that borrowing is on display in a very overt and a very important way. In fact, for the objects that you talk about, they really couldn't exist right. without that kind of transnational, sometimes transcontinental borrowing that you are describing. How did you come 
to pick these objects to anchor your chapters? And maybe you could just give a couple of examples yeah, yeah, to yeah, the yeah. audience. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so I think once I had sort of, for myself, come up with the importance of borrowing across culture as sort of one of the through lines, I wanted to pick examples of that and sort of to show different kinds of borrowing. Sometimes it's the borrowing of, of a single object like that South Asian statue in, in Pompeii. Sometimes it's, I also started to think about who does the borrowing, who moves culture from one place to another. So I focus on certain travelers like the Chinese traveler Shan Shuang who go, goes to India to find the birthplace of the Buddha and brings back lots of manuscripts and Buddhist artifacts and it really shapes uh, uh, the way Buddhism is understood in China. And then I have a Japanese monk who goes to China uh, and brings back Chinese forms of Buddhism and culture and brings that to, to, to J Japan. So sometimes it's actual travelers who do the moving. Sometimes it's entire cultures basically importing a kind of package of culture as, as Rome does with Greece or as Japan does with, um, with, with China. Sometimes it's a single text. So one of my favorite examples is the Ethiopian Kebra Nagast, uh, a really fascinating scribal text of Ethiopia that takes its point of departure from an episode of the Hebrew Bible where the king of Sheba comes to wise King Solomon and wants to check out whether he's really as wise as everyone says. And she's skeptical, she cross-examines him, and by the end she feels like, yeah, she's not bad, you know, he's pretty wise, all right, goes back. Uh, so according to the Kebra Nagast, um, that, all that happens, but one more thing happens in that she gets pregnant with King Solomon's son. She, the son grows up in Ethiopia. When he is of age, she sends him back. Uh, uh, King Solomon accepts him as his oldest son, wants him to rule in Jerusalem, but the son wants to return. Uh, and so with a group of companions, he returns. The night before they return, they steal the Ark of the Covenant that contains the Ten Commandments that uh, Moses had written down, taking dictations from God on Mount Sinai. And so they take that to Axum, and the story then says this is the foundation of Ethiopian Christianity. So a story that sort of grafts itself in some sense onto um, one text, the, you know, the Hebrew Bible, and even it contains a theft, if you will, of this object, and then sort of places Aksum in Ethiopia as the new center uh, of this, uh, you know, of this. So grafting different forms of borrowing, different objects, individuals, and so on and so forth. I was going to make a joke about the Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> but then Sorry. I realized, but then I realized there's actually a question in that, mm -hmm. which is that's a kind of grafting too, right? To yes. Yes. is that an example of crass commercial grafting or is the mediation or remediation of some of these stories to make them extremely public if also a little bit silly for entertainment purposes where does that fall on a kind of in a kind of moral or ethical consideration yeah. of the of, of culture and who can and can't possess it yeah it's <laughs> it's a good question um, it belongs I, in a museum, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, I, wait, are you asking about Indiana Jones? I am asking about okay, Indiana yeah, yeah, Jones. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm yeah, asking yeah, about right. Indiana Jones. Well, there, it's funny that, you know, in this age of revivals, we just had, uh, you know, a, a, a revival of Indiana Jones. And the college professor who goes out and becomes a kind of, despite himself, in a way, this kind of action hero. Yeah, I think the, the, the stories... I tell about borrowing, uh, I'd say a little more interesting, <laughs> are not the, you know, the, the American white college professor going to these places and uh, being a hero. Yeah. And, and more importantly, you see, and I think there is a sense in which sometimes, and I understand for good reasons, the, either the story of you know, European and Americans going out and finding these objects is seen as, you know, as part of colonialism, and it is, uh, but I think the deeper story is that 
different forms of borrowing have been going on for much longer. It's not just a, the colonialism is sort of one and mostly bad, though I think Willie Dalrymple also earlier today showed interesting gray zones or out of that relationship interesting artworks arising. But, uh, but yeah, I, so <laughs> I, I, I hope I'm not telling the Indiana Jones kind of story. No, 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 no. I, I, was, I was asking you to judge Indiana Jones, to judge not Indiana to, Jones. but, but we, yes. can, we can get onto my y-axis okay. now instead right, of, instead good. of. Uh, I'll think a little bit yeah, more about yeah. Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if the x-axis is preservation to erasure, then for me, the y-axis in this book is two different kinds of knowledge that get preserved or erased, which you describe in your first chapter, know what mm. and know how, where know what might be some kind of factual information about the past and, and know how is a kind of technique, right? So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit mm. about know how and yes. know what and how that was a kind of second uh, yeah. second entry point into yeah, yeah. the chapters here well so it it I put it slightly differently but it, yeah, yeah. I, it's 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 the right axis so the know-how I base going back to basic principles and thinking about how we need to pass down any form of knowledge mm. I made the distinction between know-how which I see as a sort of technical knowledge mm. how to make fire mm. uh, you know how to build uh, buildings, uh, uh, technical and, if you will, finally scientific knowledge, uh, transforming the natural world, and what I call know why, oh, no which why, is, more, which no is why, the, yeah. more the kind of meaning-making right, right, activity. Right, right. And this goes back to your earlier question about culture. Yeah. Uh, so for me, that, that is sort of my shorthand for cultural work, mm. which uh, of course also contains technical knowledge about how to paint or, or so on and so forth, all the techniques artists use, but ultimately this is in the service of a kind of know why yeah, question, yeah. and I think that uh, that for me just is was sort of a, a way of describing this w continual work of meaning making that you find in all societies, uh, uh, but that is sort of at the center here. Yeah. So yeah sorry. Know what? Know how are the, No, those are the analytic philosophers distinction. So that's <laughs> yes. why I, I map them onto yours for some reason. But you know, I want to go back to something that you said at the very beginning, which was that. People like you and me and our friends do often sit around tables bemoaning the crisis of the humanities in the university. And you're right that we don't often know exactly what we're talking about when we complain. And one account of the humanities that your book seemed to resonate with is an account that comes from a scholar that I think we both like, a man named John Guillory, who has a fantastic essay in which he argues that the humanities are, uh, what unites the humanities is their preoccupation with objects that call to us from the past. Mm. And in calling to us from the past, make certain demands on us in the present to help speak for them. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you think about that account of the humanities as being Prim as being primarily about the objects of the past and if we do have a responsibility to speak for them, yeah. how it is we ought to speak and who it is that we ought to speak to because the audience in this room is different from the audiences in our yeah. college classrooms. Yes, yes. And I just want to say your review of John Guillory's last book in The New Yorker is just a fantastic oh, piece of writing and I urge everyone to, oh, to read it. And so I agree, that I think this is a wonderful uh, definition and I agree with it. Um, but I also agree with your conclusion at the end of this review, namely that there's something that has gone wrong in academic humanities and that we need to find a way of opening up the humanities, doing, sometimes it's called public humanities, uh, you, you, uh, uh, to find a way of bringing that attention and care out of these, especially these very elite college classrooms and, and make it so that people can participate in them. And I think that's really important. And for me, that's one for me, at least, the sort of one thing that clearly I take away from the, the so-called crisis of the academic humanities is that we, we need to do that. Mm -hmm. Are there certain things that you think can be, are there certain ways of meaning making let's say, that you think that different institutions preserve 
uh, that different institutions are better at preserving. Mm. So are there certain kinds of objects mm. or ways of interacting with them yeah. that the school is better at preserving? And are there certain kinds of objects and ways of interacting with them that say the library yeah, or yeah. a festival yeah, yeah. Uh, or a community yeah. workshop is better yeah. at preserving? How do you think about how do you think about preservation as something that can be shared yeah. but differently with different responsibilities? Yeah, yeah. I have to think more about it. I think it's a it's a really interesting question. One, it's sort of an answer to your question, I hope, uh, and it relates to the library. Something because my, you know, my main discipline is yours is, is is literature and literary history. So I edit this anthology of world literature, and you know, each new revision we struggle what to include and what to exclude. And this time around, and we are in the middle of this work, we are worrying a lot about oral literature. And because this is something that libraries and anthologies are not good at uh, preserving. That festivals, we heard a wonderful performance this morning, though recorded, uh, mm -hmm. of the Colorado Port Laureate. Uh, festivals are much more, much better at it uh, uh, because literature becomes alive, authors speak, recite, uh, discuss. Uh, and so, um, but libraries are, are less good and anthologies are less good and literature departments are less good in thinking about it. And it's a very profound thing in the context of that anthology because even the question of where you, you know, so a piece of oral literature has been written down at some point. Where do you put it in the anthology at the time when it was written down, at the time when the stories started, this time when it is set? You realize that our the mechanisms for preserving literature are so profoundly based on writing mm. that that it kind of oral literature once you start fundamentally about it sort of blows your mind you have mm. to completely think differently about it and of course also the what's the what's the best version what's the authoritative version how should i include several versions of this oral story uh, or not so so that right now i find myself puzzling about the the limits, and of course, libraries sometimes have, you know, uh, reels of of uh, of oral poets reciting poetry or or videos. Uh, um, but how to access them and how to teach, and this is, goes back to students, how to teach audiences, and I include myself, uh, uh, how to interact with oral literature. Uh, it's, it's a profound challenge, but a really interesting one. I think. Well, I mean, it interestingly takes us to the end of the mm. book, to, to, to K-pop, uh, in a sense. But, but what you were saying about, about everything leaving a trace, mm. you know, a, a, a final axis. I'm sorry, I, I was only going to stay <laughs> with two dimensions. Let me, let me introduce the, the third dimension, which should really be the fourth dimension, which is time. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the past to the present. I mean, in the present right now, one worry I imagine most of us have is that everything we do right. can leave a trace, right. especially our digital activity. Right. And that's tied to an, uh, kind of an attendant anxiety which I often feel, which is that there's actually too much culture right, being produced. Right, right. There's too much culture being produced and there aren't enough ways in the present of figuring out how to discriminate between mm. the culture I should consume yes. and the culture yes. I ought not to yes. consume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in some sense, time also operates faster because people forget things faster yeah. when there's so much culture yeah. being produced. So yeah. can you just speak a little yeah, bit about yeah. how this history mm. will help us orient ourselves to what feels like a very chaotic cultural present? Right. Yeah, no, it, and it, in some sense for me, this goes back to storage. Uh, and I think this is one reason why storage became came a little bit of a through line mm -hmm. because throughout most of cultural history stor storage or preser preservation was hugely very costly right mm -hmm. it humans had to just d devote enormous resources to recopying books or preserving caves or uh, uh, creating libraries and so that there was a darwinian struggle if you will and and very few things survived and many f fell by the by the wayside um, and in some sense this has changed because Store, the cost of storage has gone almost down to zero. Mm -hmm. So creating this, this, this world that you described where everything gets preserved or almost everything and where we have sort of the surfeit of information. But I think that's 
in some sense true, but there's also limits to which this is true, and there are a couple of limits. One is the obsolescence of electronic storage. And so, you know, I, the, in the early days of the internet, scholars created all these uh, uh, databases of literature and pr tried to preserve literature. Half of these databases, or more than half, probably 80%, are now just orphan sites that are floating inaccessible on, on the internet. Mm -hmm. The floppy disk is, of course, obsolete. And so, and the same even with our social media companies, where things, just because of the cost, will get uh, deleted. Mm -hmm. So for the historians of the future, yes, there will be an abundance of certain kinds of culture, um, but also really enormous lacunae, I think, because of obsolescence of storage media and coding, because only certain things show up in these electronic storage media in the first place. And in the previous session, you know, we, I think we got an, a, a also a sense of everything that's not talked about or written about or published about. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's not as simple as saying, okay, now we have the cost of storage down to zero, we have abundance and therefore we need to search. Mm -hmm. what, this is, of course, why search has become in filters yeah. uh, and algorithms and recommendations and all of that have become crucial. But they're, they're, we are also still actually living in this world where things get lost, where they get erased mm -hmm. um, on a maybe different scale. It's interesting you mention algorithms because a friend of mine just sent me a job posting in your department at Harvard for a professor of comparative literature with a specialty in translation studies. And one of the uh, desirable qualifications that was listed on that job ad was that the person had some familiarity with AI mm. and chat GPT mm. methods of language mm. processing. Mm. So when we talk about mm. the production of culture, of meaning making, of know-how of technique. Mm. How is it that these new kinds of yeah. technologies are complicating something like translation studies mm. and the kinds of borrowing that can happen yeah. in the world? Yeah, yeah. No, and you know, I ever, you know, not ever since, since November, <laughs> I have been mulling this over. Uh, and I have to say, I kind of, I change my mind literally every five minutes. So I'll just give you the two, my two minds. Mm. Uh, the one is that, and as people have said, this uh, you know, artificial intelligence is really forcing us to articulate what is human, forcing us or, or confirming in some sense the importance of affirming human meaning-making activity, sort of the story I'm trying to tell in this book, uh, because it's something that it, it's a mechanical for intelligence and can do that, it's only what humans can do. So great, we feel good about ourselves. My other mind says, well, you know, this is a story of borrowing, as you point out, and of, you know, a lacunae and a misunderstanding and so on and so forth. Basically everything that, uh, of hallucinations, basically everything AI has been accused of engaging in. And of course it's true, I mean, it's using what we feed into it, and it's re-scrambling it and, and mirroring it back to us. Uh, so sometimes I think that it's, it, it, it isn't so different from what we are doing. And, and you could arguably say that language itself is a kind of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, certainly writing is, and you know, there are language theories, mm -hmm. deconstruction and others that basically say that, you know, language is this artificial intelligence that somehow has gotten hold of humans and is now speaking us. Uh, you know, I don't fully subscribe to these, but I find myself going back to it. In any case, I think it may be a mistake to be too comfortable in saying, oh, we humans, we are, you know, these organic, uh, 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 culture-producing, uh, uh, wonderful creatures, and here's this bad uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So I, I basically flip between those mm. two positions, mm. and I, I don't quite know how to resolve that. Well, you're making me think about the us in the mm. title, mm. and you're making me also think about how that first chapter begins with 
Is it an okapi going down into the caves? What, which animal goes down into the caves, gets stuck at the end, turns yes. around, and then comes an, an, back? An ibex. An ibex, yeah. sorry, yeah. not an okapi, an ibex. Mm -hmm. An ibex goes into the cave, gets stuck, turns around, comes back, and the footprints are still mm. preserved. Mm. And you're making me think if that us could include not just non-human intelligences, but also animal intelligence right. or intelligences right. across different species, because in part, the story that you mm. are telling is not just a story of the machines that humans make or the meaning humans make, but the kinds of traces that non-human presences yes. leave on those meaning-making enterprises. So does that us keep getting bigger and bigger on the one hand, or in an age of tribalism and yeah regionalism yes. and xenophobia does that us get yeah, smaller yeah, yeah. and smaller i think that that's beautifully put and i think that i don't think i would have been able to come up with the former mm. uh, uh, but i think that's a really nice way of thinking about it mm. uh, and especially reading that opening scene the the latter was certainly on my mind and mm. i think what i was trying to push against because you know, primarily what I felt like I was writing against implicitly through the story wasn't so much the worry about cultural appropriation, that was sort of a secondary thought, but precisely the narrow, the narrowing, the, the, the ethno-nationalism that mm -hmm. you don't have to list uh, uh, where everywhere in the world that uh, has us in its grip. And so, um, but I, I, I really like the, the, the us, the expa ever expansive, uh, us that's um, um, that's doing that in conjunction with objects and ecosystems mm -hmm. perhaps and, and animals yeah that's very nice I'm wondering if there's a middle scale too in what we're talking about I'm just mindful of the fact that we are at the Jaipur Literary Festival in Colorado mm -hmm. right and that there's something interesting about thinking of that as the intersection of cities of something smaller than the nation, but bigger mm. than the mm. tribal unit or the yes. racial unit yes. or the ethnic unit. And I wonder if there's some middle mm. ground here in which cultural transmission is, is happening. And if that's yeah. part of the story yeah. that many of your examples are taking place in that middle ground, somewhere below, below the nation, but also above the nation at yes. the same time. And in, uh, I think that's very interesting in, in cities and networks of cities. Right. Uh, I mean, this is what JLF is a network that's connecting places, connecting cities. Uh, um, I suppose of all the cities, this may be the smallest, uh, Belfast, maybe, mm -hmm. and Colorado. I don't know, one I, of the organizers can tell, out, Willie, out Willie can tell us. Someone help me out here. Willie can tell us, yeah. But, you know, smaller cities, large cities, mm -hmm. uh, 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 world cities, mm -hmm. uh, more, I don't want to say provincial cities, but regional cities, mm -hmm. perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, it's true. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you know, people have pointed out many times that it's cities that are sort of cultural centers and that in some sense, cities are more closely connected than each mm -hmm. city is with its hinterland. Yeah. And I, I think that... Uh, it is not something I thought very much about or made explicit choices about, but I think you're right, is, is a pattern that emerges. Let me ask you one final question and then I'm going to turn to the audience, so please have your questions ready. I will ask you an unfair and Good. impossible question, which is that I know you and I are both people who do spend a lot of time wondering what the future of the humanities will be, what our, what use our fairly specialized forms of knowledge might have. And I walked away from reading this feeling entirely more optimistic than I think I should feel. <laughs> uh, and so part, part of me uh, wants to thank you for that. And then part of me wants to ask you to envision, again, impossible and unfair question, how we might bring this optimism into the future. What is the mm. most optimistic vision for culture, the story of us in the next, let us say, 50 years? Mm. Mm. And mm. will we, will it have any use for people like you and me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that will be up to us, I yeah. think. Um, it, it is an optimistic story. I think, I, I mean, I wrote this book during COVID, so I think yeah. I was trying to, amp myself up here a little bit. Uh, um, um, but I do think that um, so much reporting about culture uh, has to do with cases of 
uh, of conflict, mm -hmm. uh, of erasure, of you know restitution. I mean, I think there 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 are lots of negative or conflictual stories about culture. Book bans right now but are the one where my we, mind immediately goes. And yes, we will yes. be talking about that tomorrow. And of course, that's hugely crucial. But I think sometimes that 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 longer history and perhaps that optimistic history is, gets lost because I do think we are culture producing species and we do it in some sense automatically wherever humans live together, they produce culture. And so it's not so much a, a, a weather question, but how. Um, and I do think that um, we've been in a moment, and maybe we're still in that, and maybe that's good, where we have drawn a lot of negative lessons from history, how not to share, uh, uh, maybe in relations of extreme power imbalance and appropriation and so on and so forth, imposing one culture onto another. Um, and I think that's an important corrective uh, um, and it's important to learn from these negative stories. But m my hope is that out of that com comes a more affirmative uh, view of culture, and I think that people yearn for that. Uh, I think that people outside the university gravitate towards that in some sense more naturally than what we have been focusing on in the university. So, so that makes me always optimistic, engaging with you know, audiences like here. Um, so I, I suppose I remain an optimist because I think that we have a need for it. We, we do it uh, and it, it, uh, I think that maybe we will learn to do it in a better way. Audience, yes. Oh, look how quickly this hand went up. Just shot right up, that's what I wanna see. Go ahead. What's your name? My name's Marco. Hi, Marco. Hi. Um, I really liked the XY axis uh, framing of the conversation and the distinction between preservation and erasure. And it occurred to me there might be another axis, Please. like a Z axis, which would be I innovation. Knew it. <laughs> Sorry, that was In innovation. Innovation, yes. Creativity or novelty. Right. And yes. I wonder how you think about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And th this, in fact, it, it, it goes off the erasure axis because one of the, and it, it posed an interesting dilemma for me. Uh, so I think that innovation happens a lot, actually in moments when there is, when transmission sputters in some sense, when there is some, when there's a loss, when after 2000 years, a second group of humans enters the Chauvet cave and needs to figure out what's happening here. Uh, when something gets miscommunicated or mistranslated or misunderstood, that's often when innovation happens because that allows for a space of play, mobility, rather than strictly, you know, one form of painting being passed down from one uh, tradition to the next. This created an interesting problem, and I haven't resolved this paradox, which is, well, in that case, we should encourage misunderstanding and misreading and interruptions, and that can't quite be the case because on the other hand you also have to preserve some of the material you're going to be working with but i historic again if you look at it from the bird's eye view it i can't help but admit that these sort of accidents when transmission when institutions break down are, are often the moment when when innovation happens although it can also be the moment when loss happens so uh, the the two seem to be strangely twinned uh, and maybe um, that's something worth thinking about some more. But I'm really glad you, you opened the, the Z axis uh, um, and it, it, it throws up interesting questions, I think. I think it's technically the A prime axis because <laughs> we already had, <laughs> me neither, I don't know what comes after Z. Can we have other questions? Yes, over here. Hi, my name is Rachna. Um, I uh, wanted to talk, uh, get your views on a recent article I read uh, relating to a, British, uh, a museum curator who was fired because of unethical sourcing of material for a display they were making. And I, what struck me though in that article that I was reading was that somehow um, materials sourced before the 1970s were not subject to that same kind of scrutiny as those that would be post-70s. 
uh, which I find surprising that as a culture we have reached that conclusion because it's almost that before 70s we're saying that yes, colonialism happened and that material would have been sourced through colonial, colonized exploitation of um, other places, but that was somehow okay because there's no one to be held accountable for it. And so I wonder when you talk about borrowing um, and doing it ethically as a form of quote unquote cultural appropriation that may not be so bad, that may help spreading of culture and mm. under, creating an understanding of identity and other cultures, what is the responsibility of that borrower when there is a history of being a dominant community, yes. of being responsible for the exploitations of the very cultures they're borrowing from? I mean, there is a huge responsibility, and thank you for that, for that question. And, and, you know, there, finally, very belatedly, some museums are starting to look reluctantly into their own histories and looking into the things they didn't want to know. Uh, and sometimes there's, I think there usually is actually more material than, and I think Willie uh, earlier was talking about amazing stories uh, of huge amounts of material suddenly turning up. So I think there is uh, uh, actually more material you know, material that describes some of these uh, practices. Uh, but, but I think there's a huge responsibility to, to recognize the institutions and their histories and, and their responsibility. Um, and I think it's, it's good that some museums are starting to do that and more need to do that. Uh, I think that I, I'm, I'd like to make two distinctions, perhaps. Uh, I think it's clearest in the case when we are actually talking about actual objects, often unique objects, um, and not, you know, there are so many forms of immaterial culture where in some sense it's not a zero-sum game, but with objects it's, you know, an actual object and maybe sometimes there are many of its kind and sometimes there are very few and, and, and they're unique. And you have to make very hard distinction, uh, very hard decisions about returning them. Uh, uh, sometimes museums are engaging in, in practices where where some objects are returned, some are allowed to be kept under long-term leases. My, uh, I'll say as a, a, a final point here, a, a version of what I said earlier, I think, I think all of that is a Im hugely important correction. Um, and, uh, but uh, what my hope is that at the end of the day, the, the goal is not to have less borrowing, but better borrowing and more borrowing. But for this to happen, institutions need to recognize their own complicity in history, uh, 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 and, and that is slowly starting, but you know, we are not where we need to be in that history. I just want to draw out the point that you made about immaterial mm. culture. I can't remember who wrote this fabulous article I read recently on UNESCO World Heritage mm -hmm. designations and how mm -hmm. those are increasingly given not just to cities but to cuisines yes. and to dialects. Right. And the question is what does it mean to call a dialect or a cuisine mm. something mm. that gets UNESCO World Heritage status and to designate it as belonging to a particular city or to a particular people when anyone really can speak Yes. the dialect and anyone can participate in the making or the consuming of the cuisine. Right. Yes. And so these immaterial cultural mm. objects actually, or um, immaterial cultural practices, practices. let's say, yes. I really push on this question of who, of whether culture can be possessed yes. and whether it can have boundaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think, I think these, that's it. Intangible, okay. yes, Thank in, you. In, intangible. intangible cultural heritage. Uh, um, I think I so I love. I, I think it's hugely important that uh, that that category exists. Also, I'm partially from the performing arts, especially dance, uh, and so on and so forth. That, that is something that another thing like oral literature that that cultural preserv preservation regimes have had trouble understanding, uh, uh, and so intangible heritage does that. I think the idea here, again, should not be, and for the most part isn't, to say only you are allowed to do that, although, you know, there are always complicated mechanisms, you know, to, for an outsider to, to enter, but, uh, but it is more to say that, you know, culture isn't just uh, 
buildings and manuscripts and paintings. Uh, they're, they're, they, it hap something often that happens between people that gets passed down from one person to the next person. And, 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 and I, think that, so that's, I, I, I think that's a hugely important designation, actually. Yes. So I'm on the y-axis going down <laughs> on a dark note, thinking of the recent movie Oppenheimer, Mm -hmm. And, of course, the cross-cultural insight when he reads the Hindu hymn, I Am Death. I'm thinking of the English patient and the man from India who cannot, who uh, mm -hmm. undoes unexploded bombs, yes. cannot undo the nuclear age. I'm thinking of William Dalrymple's talk this morning on the British East India Company. Mm. And I'm thinking of New Delhi today in such tremendous air pollution, not only from the Industrial Revolution, but from cars and gas. And it seems to me, my, my question is, on the dark note going down, are we a species where a dominant culture is capable of destruction that overcomes all the other kinds of cultural integration that make for a rising species. That, that is a dark note. I think we need a whole new letter of the alphabet or a whole different alphabet in order to designate that axis. But no, it's a fair question. You know, when you started with Oppenheimer uh, and that, and that quote, I thought you were going, and I was in India when that movie came out, and rightly people were incensed uh, that that quote uh, is in the middle of a sex scene, completely gratuitous. I mean, it's, you know, it's so sensationalistic. Why? Why put it there? But so you went really to the to the destructive potential. And it's true. And even though I'm an optimist, there are lots of moments of destruction in this book, including the arrival of Spaniards in the New World and the destruction, uh, for example, of the Aztec Empire uh, uh, and, 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 and many other examples. Uh, there is no doubt that destruction is, is part of human history. Uh, um, and and um, since the nuclear age, we've had the capacity to, to, to actually bring about the complete destruction uh, of, of humankind. And, and it, I've also been interested in how through the climate discourse, I think we sometimes gravitate towards that apocalyptic discourse too quickly, in my opinion, but that's a different matter. So yeah, destruction is here. Uh, and your question, I think, is a different answer to Merve's uh, question about the next 50 years and the 50 years after. Well, or there's a different author who would have written a book called Culture, the Story of the Death Drive, from cave art to yeah. K-pop. I mean, have you seen the K-pop fans and what they are capable of, right? But, but that's a different kind of, that's a different kind of yes, book. Yeah, a that's a different kind of, kind of book, yeah. <laughs> yes, K-pop. Right. Yeah, right, exactly. Or to Barbie, yeah, to Barbie, yeah. Yes. Thank you for that great discussion. I really enjoyed it. On that note, on Oppenheimer, I would just like to bring a couple more things. Um, Nolan being a great director, I admire him a lot. But not only was that scene misplaced, which I didn't bother me much, hmm. what was misplaced was the emphasis in the original work where Sri Krishna is enjoining Arjuna right. to follow right. his dharma, yes. to do the righteous right. thing and take on Right. The, the enemies of, and, and the forces of dark, yes. and here he has mis, he misappropriated it. That also is a part of culture, yes. but he, he missed a, a trick here by forgetting a, a bigger element that is there in the scripture, which is part of a spiritual dimension, which he missed here with Oppenheimer. Yes. And I believe that Oppenheimer had it, despite all his problems and challenges, which the great director missed, yeah. but that's part of culture. I think that's a very good point. It's the question of just war uh, that, that Oppenheimer in its own way tries to answer, though it isn't very good about it. Uh, no, thank you very much for this comment. I totally agree. <laughs>
hold it close. Yeah, thanks for the interesting discussion. Uh, in fact, uh, to be optimistic, there is probably need for more of the borrowing because that is what survives. Yes. And in fact, the culture that we today uh, have of the past is on the time axis that has averaged knocking out all the, and you made a good point of there is so much that's coming, what to preserve. Time will take care because you, not everything needs to be preserved. Mm -hmm. Many of them are probably derivatives. And you let some time pass yes. and you get clarity on what is need, what needs to be preserved and yes. what, what is probably a subset of what is already. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. Question I have is, uh, so I, I also like to your cultural appropriation perspective because oftentimes the, the term gets very, people get very riled up one way or the other. Mm. I think your, your clarification and the context I thought was very, very nicely done. Uh, last a question to you is in your research, have you come across where culture survived because a group just moved because of environmental conditions that they had to just migrate and therefore it ended up being preserved in toto as opposed to some of the examples you give of travelers coming in, dipping in, sort of taking a sample and then planting it elsewhere which then blooms in its own way. Uh, so I was just curious if, if you came across any. Because of, yeah, groups move, I mean, individuals move and groups move and take their culture with them. I mean, there are many examples, but specifically for environmental... Like I'm thinking Central Asia and the Black Sea migration. Yes. That happened and led to peopling of South Asia and other parts. Yes. And much of, much of the modern day uh, cultural practices Yes. can be traced to those groups, but I'm yeah. just curious. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, if one takes a very expansive view of environmental change, I mean, Peter Frankopan has just written that massive history of, uh, 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 history of environmental change, and by, by that token, actually, a lot of migration, including the, you know, the, the great migration from Central Asia to, to, to Europe uh, uh, at the end of the Roman Empire, and so on and so forth, are at least partially also migrations uh, um, due to environmental change. Uh, so I think, and, and I think it is a very interesting perspective he, he, opens, he opens up there. Um, so what le gets left behind are places. So, you know, I've written a lot about the Epic of Gilgamesh. Finally, last year, I was able to go to Iraq and go to these places in southern Iraq, like Uruk, uh, uh, where the Epic of Gilgamesh is, is set. And it, it's amazing to see even there. So the Epic of Gilgamesh, in a way, uh, represents an early phase of human change, changes to the environment because of the urban revolution, there's widespread deforestation. And the Epic of Gilgamesh tells a story of having to go on a logging expedition all the way to Lebanon, in fact, to bring back timber. And if you go there today, you can see it's basically a desert uh, because of deforestation and because the river has moved about 20 miles. So you see these places that have been left behind uh, but the people have, of course, moved. Uh, uh, and so I think that uh, migration um, is a huge driver of, of that, not just of individuals, but of entire groups. Yeah. Let us take one more question. And I will just point out what an excellent audience Q&A this mm. has been. Really, you're all, you all deserve a round of applause, too, which we will give you at the, at the yeah, well, we can give you now. Let's just give you all a round of applause now. So these are really, really good questions. Can we hear the final one? Oh, OK. Uh, yes, the final yeah. question, please. Yeah, thank you for the uh, wonderful conversation. So I was just wondering, you mentioned about environmental change. Uh, and So in some way, uh, the story of evolution or story of cave art to cake pop is also a story of evolution. And a lot of people think how the environmental is changing. We're sort of going towards Mad Max kind of world where the culture is, in a way, deteriorating or degrading. So I just wanted to understand your opinion, how you think it's evolving, or you think it's probably devolving in a certain way. 
Yeah, I, I don't think we are in a Mad Max world. Uh, uh, for me, Mad Max is more part of that weird genre of sort of post-apocalyptic. Uh, uh, and, and it's interesting that that's a relatively recent genre, and I have lots of thoughts about it. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's interesting to think about why we love that kind of story, that post-apocalyptic story so much. And I think part of it is that it's, it takes away all the, it, it washes away all the inessential things that allows us to really think what's, what's it, what is life really about? All, you know, no, no more cell phones or internet. Yes, there are some cars. Roads, exactly. <laughs> road. The open road. Uh, uh, so, it, it, so, but uh, yeah, no, I don't, I, I don't think we live in a moment of cultural degradation uh, at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and it's sort of how we started. Uh, I think it's mostly academic humanities that are in crisis because, I mean, JLF is a perfect example that the humanities are not in crisis if you do it right. Uh, uh, and I think this is what Mervyn uh, and I are also uh, uh, in agreement with. So I agree that it, it's not that the human, in fact, you know, in, in, in my universities, I spend a lot of time for various reasons with people in the business school and the, in the medical school and those are the some of the biggest believers in the humanities they just have no one to talk to in the humanities departments uh, uh, so i you know anyway it, you, you know i'm writing a book about this have we talked I, about this well, you do i okay. I, I, yeah, yeah, I do yeah, yeah, and yeah, 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 you know yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Well, I mean, I just think what, what Martin is saying is absolutely is absolutely correct, that there are so many people who are interested in interacting with our objects, our objects. They are just not interested in interacting with them in these highly specialized ways. And those highly specialized ways are often only for the purposes of creating a kind of in-group conversation among people with the kinds of credentials that you and I, you and I have. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And so I think when you look at this audience, when I listen to the questions from this audience, when I think about how many different ways there are to transmit and preserve culture today, when I think about the great efflorescence of objects and mediums and formats and styles and people who can be a part of it, I do feel optimistic and I don't think it's a story of degradation, but I do think you're right that it is up to us how we make the work of preservation and transmission pleasurable for as many people as possible because it's about pleasure. These are objects that bring us pleasure and you cannot shortchange pleasure. And this has been a very pleasurable conversation, so let us end it on that note. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.